over here, I am Judy Newhauser. I'm the president of Morocost Audubon. And I really want to thank you for all coming to our second ever Zoom community meeting. Um, it's not quite the same as having it in person, but it's we've, we're discovering that it has some real benefits. It's great for people who don't want to drive, especially at night. It's great for people who live out of the area. Um, so that's been really wonderful. It's also great to have be able to have presenters from out of the area, like our presenter tonight, Jillian Martin, who's coming to us from Southern California and did not have to get in her car and drive. So thank you all for coming. Uh, let me go over very briefly Zoom etiquette. We, if you join in a little bit later than, uh, if as you join, if you would mute your microphone and and cut the video, your video of yourself um, during the presentation. If you have a question during the, the time that Jillian's talking, there's a little chat button, should be at the bottom, sort of the middle of your, your Zoom screen. You can go ahead and submit that question on chat, put your name on it, and that way when we get to the end and have question and answers, I'll go down that list and we'll call for the particular name and then you can unmute yourself, ask your question, mute yourself again, and Jillian can answer. Okay, so uh, a couple of announcements. We are going to be having another Zoom community meeting for June. Usually we have our picnic, but the picnic has been canceled since in-person meetings of large groups of people are still being discouraged and our usual place is being used for other things. So it's going to be Dave Clendenin, who is our preserve manager for the Sweet Springs Nature Preserve, and he's going to be doing a presentation on wolves in Yellowstone. Uh, should be a very interesting program. Dave has worked for many years, was working with the Condor Recovery Program. He was the Wind Wolves Preserve Manager at the southern end of the San Joaquin Valley, which is a 90,000 acre preserve. So doing our 32 acres is kind of small peanuts to him, but it promises to be a very good lecture on Wolves of Yellowstone. So I'm gonna make one plea for money. We still have expenses. Uh, we are still paying rent on the Botanic Garden in spite of the fact we are not having our community meetings there. Um, and, you know, we're all in this together. The, the Botanic Garden is struggling in the same way every nonprofit is. So we'll be working with them to come up with an equitable sharing of the pain. But we also have rent on the office. And of course, our publicly accessible properties like Sweet Springs and the Overlook at 4th Street, take constant upkeep and maintenance, and we do hire preserve managers. So anybody who wishes to help us out with all those expenses, you can go to the Moore Coast Audubon Society website and click on the donate button, and we would truly appreciate it. Um, there's a couple of things I'd like to talk about. Some of you have noticed over the last month, we were having an issue with somebody who was cutting the locks on our Iron Ranger and installing his own lock, <laughs> and then coming by and stealing the donations. We have stopped that. We found the person, the sheriff's deputy has talked to him. Uh, Dave Clendenin has remodified the Iron Rangers and we think we have stopped that person cold. So please feel free to continue to donate at the Sweet Springs Nature Preserve in the Iron Rangers. Um, the last thing I wanted to, to make sure people knew. A lot of you have heard about the loss of one of our breeding great horned owls at the Sweet Springs Preserve. It was found one day bleeding profusely and was found dead the following day. And the vet at Pacific Wildlife Care could not find a wound that would cause that kind of bleeding. So we have sent the carcass up to California Department of Fish and Wildlife for testing for suspected rodenticide poisoning. Two days later, the owlet, one of the owlets was found at the base of the tree, pretty emaciated. So we took it to Pacific Wildlife Care and the vet suspects it is also has been poisoned by rodenticide. We don't have testing on it, but it's being treated with vitamin K and it's being fed up. It has almost doubled its weight. So it looks like the owlet is going to make it. 
But just a reminder to everybody, um, the rodenticides that are on the market these days are, are anticoagulants. They are long lived and persistent. They don't break down easily. A dead rodent who has been poisoned will poison whatever eats that rodent. And if they die, they poison whatever eats them. It moves up the food chain. So be very careful. Um, and we'd really recommend you find other alternatives to rodenticide poisoning. <laughs> So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. It's a great pleasure to introduce you to Jillian Martin. She's a Southern California Audubon member for nearly 20 years. She's a passionate voice for birds and more recently for trees. When awakened to the ecological value of dead trees in 2011, she founded the Cavity Conservation Initiative, CCI. And her mission is to promote the safe retention of dead trees to, en to enhance urban forest diversity. Her work with CCI led her to become a co-founder of the Tree Care for Birds and Other Wildlife Program of the Western Chapter of the International Society of Arboriculture. She works with a team of diverse stakeholders to reduce impacts on nesting birds during tree care and to manage trees to support birds. So Julian, thank you for being here tonight, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you, Judy. Hello, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for joining me this evening for this webinar. It's a little strange talking to my computer and not seeing you, but I'm sure you all share my gratitude to Morrow Coast Audubon for making this opportunity possible. And I'm going to say at the start that I assume because you are Audubon members that you already know much of what I'm going to share. It may be in bits and pieces in your memory and in your mind. So I see my job as really pulling those bits of information together as if they were pieces of a, a, a puzzle waiting to be assembled and to put them all in a very nice picture for you. Uh, in the hope that when you leave this, uh, this webinar, that you will be eager to look for um, dead trees in your community with the possibility of considering advocating for their safe retention. So um, let's begin. I just want to review for you what I you know, plan to go through here. So I'm going to talk first of all about the historical role of dead trees in natural forest systems because I think since they have such a reduced presence in places where we live, perhaps we've, um, you know, out of sight, out of mind, we've sort of lost sight of what Mother Nature really had in mind for dead trees when they're in natural forest systems. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the wildlife associated with dead trees in California, just a sample of them. And I'm going to talk about um, how to select and manage dead trees in the urban forest. So we have some practical ways of, of approaching this um, conservation effort in places where we live. And then I'm going to point to some resources that are available to you that I recommend and remind you in case you don't know that I've sent, I think, four handouts today to upload onto your website that will supplement the information that I provide today. Those handouts are also available on the Cavity Conservation Initiatives website and many others. So I will encourage you to go to the website as well for other resources that I can't um, talk about today. Okay, so I wanna talk for Mother Nature and say that Mother Nature had in mind that a tree has two lives. One when it's healthy, and growing and mature, all the years that it stands in place as a healthy tree. And another one to begin when a tree starts to fail. Because ecological, um, ecologists and biologists and other scientists who make observations and study trees in all their successional stages, tell us that they're actually, if the trees are in healthy habitats, right, you typically natural forest systems, that there are more organisms that use a tree in its decline and its gradual stages of uh, um, decay than in all the years the tree stood as a healthy tree. 
and that organisms utilize dead trees as they're declining in different successional stages and that the tree's ultimate destiny really is to return its nutrients to the soil. And it's possible that it may take a tree as many years to die as the tree actually has lived in a healthy condition. So that, you know, for instance, there are some oaks that may take 500 years to die. So when we remove a tree that starts to fail, like this one here in the center, and we remove it up right down to the stump, we actually prevent the tree from fulfilling its second life, its ultimate destiny. So the goal is to change public perception of dead trees to allow some, when possible, to remain safely in place. So, <clears throat> you know, when a tree starts to fail, there are legions of organisms that are ready to cull those weak trees from the, from the environment, the, from their own unique ecosystems. And their job is to get the trees ready for their final resting place, which is uh, on the ground to return their nutrients to the soil. An example of some of those organisms are bark beetles. I'm sure you're familiar with these. Wood boring beetles, wood wasps, moss, termites, and flies. And their ultimate role really is to keep ecosystems in balance. <clears throat> so you know also that apart from those those insects that help that nest in dead trees and and uh, feed off the wood and break them down to some degree, the role of fungi is really as a decomposer, right? So, but apart from helping to decompose the trees, the fruiting bodies of fungi actually have a secret little world going on inside those fleshy bodies. And that is that there are a number of insects that apparently um, a nest inside of them or consume parts of their flesh and or eat each other, right? And we can see here an example of how, how spiders may string their webs under the canopy of these fruiting bodies and trap insects as they come and go. So the fungi that are doing their job in a tree um, decomposing the tree is also serving other organisms within that system. And I wanted you to take a look at this, um, this picture here of a dead tree. And I'm sure you will recognize that there are not all woodpeckers nesting in this tree. Here's the cavity entrance right here. But there is something unseen happening here that really moves our story forward. And that is that while the, the fruiting, you know, the fungi here in the tree is helping to make the wood softer and enable the woodpeckers to excavate a full cavity in there, the woodpecker actually reciprocates, gives back to the fungi by doing it a favor, unknowingly, passively, as it moves up and down the tree and, and brushes, up, brushes up against these fung fruiting bodies of the fungi, the birds and other organisms, even small mammals and insects and so on that brush up against these fruiting bodies, pick up the fungal spores on their fur, on their feathers, on their bills, on their feet. And as they move up and down the tree, they're transporting the fungal spores to other parts of the tree and traveling through the forest and transporting them as well to allow the fungal spores to do their job in other parts of the forest with downwood or in other trees that are, in, uh, are stressed and in decline. So it's so wonderful, really, you know, how nature works cooperatively. All right, so I want you to imagine yourself standing in the San Jacinto uh, forest, which is where I took this picture, and imagine what happened when this tree fell. Now, when I took the picture, it probably fell years ago, right? But can you imagine the, the compaction and the sound when this thing fell to the ground? And let's assume that there were probably fungal, um, fungal bodies, right, fruiting uh, mushrooms on that tree when it fell. And imagine how those fungal bodies got dislodged and the fungal spores got um, spread into the air and onto the ground and dispersed because the tree collapsed, right? And those fungal spores can be picked up with other organisms that come in contact to the ground or the, or the, um, the dead wood that lays there. And 
um, imagine too that maybe that that conifer had seeds that had not yet opened and those also fell to the ground and fed other organisms and were opened by the woodpecker looking for for the um, the seeds inside the conifer and imagine that there were cavity nesting birds that probably had relied on that tree for nesting opportunities and what do they do now their tree has fallen so this this natural disturbance as small as it was forces these cavity nesting birds to relocate or to disperse to find other uh, snags within the forest system and the mere fact that it forces some dispersal and forces cavity nesting birds to compete with one another for the remaining available snags actually contributes to the birds fitness right because he who is the strongest and the most aggressive is going to get that snag is going to win so this is how you know these natural disturbances have all these collateral impacts that are sometimes wonderfully beneficial where you and i walking through the forest and seeing that thing oh how sad the tree fell but in fact the field tree fell for a good reason and there are many benefits that are derived when a tree falls to the forest floor so now let's just shift our mind to the urban landscape where most of us live and here's a view of the los angeles the uh, county here and you can see how densely populated we are here and naturally because we've changed the land we have to change the rules about how trees are managed right so you're familiar with this we have a high, low tolerance to risk and so we have um we have cut uh trees down to the stump as you can see here um are you able by the way to see uh to see the full view or is this sidebar blocking the view of that picture on the right dave can you hear the question yeah we can we can see the whole view you can see the whole view okay yeah. because th this bar on the on the right here is blocking my view of that right image okay okay all right so um so what happens is when we consistently remove trees in their entirety what's happening is that we're losing cavity nesting birds that are nesting in those trees which which puts them at a higher risk um, for for destruction right so uh, we probably lose more cavity nesting birds um, in these trees than we do open cup nesters that may be in some other trees so you know the average tree care provider may say well you know what's the big deal if we only you know destroy one nest i mean what's three or five nestlings right well you know what i tell the, the tree care people is that you don't just you're not just destroying one nest you're destroying all the future generations that those birds might have produced had they fledged right so this is how we impact populations overall it's not that we kill birds a hundred or a thousand at a time that does that you know doesn't happen often we're, we're destroying birds in small amounts through one method or another and it's that accumulated loss happening regularly across the wider landscape that impacts populations so one nest does matter all right so as i'm sure you already know there are about 80 species of birds in north america that um, are considered cavity nesting birds not all of them however are obligate cavity nesters meaning that some of them will nest in other in other places other than in dead trees they find nooks and crannies and cliffs and and um, all kinds of, of other convenient places in which to make their uh, in which to raise their young um, and among these 80 cavity nesting species about 22 are woodpeckers if we count the ivory bill which most of us assume is no longer present in north america and we have oh i'm missing this i wonder if i can move it we have i have to go for memory now because i can't see this picture on the right um, we have, as I recall, um, about seven uh, ducks that are cavity nesters. We have 10 owls. We have um, two falcons, and we have about 40 songbirds. And of course, many of these birds depend on the woodpecker's abandoned cavities, right? 
um, without the woodpecker being the carpenter of the bird world, creating, uh, abandoning, creating, and abandoning all these cavities, the populations of these birds, these other secondary cavity nesters, the ones that can't ne excavate their own nest sites, would certainly decline because then they'd have to rely solely on the natural cavities found in trees or other opportunities to, to nest you know, in, in other ways. So the woodpeckers are clearly an important organism in the ecosystems in which they are present. Um, but before I leave woodpeckers and go on to uh, just, uh, show for you what some of these cavity nesters are in our area in California, I don't want to leave the woodpeckers without giving them full recognition for the other services that they provide. So woodpeckers, as you guys probably know, um, forage for insects in the air, they catch insects flying by, right? The Lewis's woodpecker is one of those that does that. And even the acorn woodpecker fly catches sometimes and some sap, sap suckers do. But woodpeckers glean insects from foliage, from the surface of bark, from behind loose bark, and actually into the, the wood, deeply into the wood to forage for boring insects in there. And you know that the, pile, uh, the pileated woodpecker goes deep into trees to get the um, carpenter ants nesting in there. And then we have the one terrestrial woodpecker, the um, northern flicker, that primarily forages on the ground and has, is a specialist of going after ants in the ground. So by part, part, partitioning their foraging habits, now so many overlap, of course, um, they actually help to reduce the insect populations in forest systems and in places where we live and they make our life more comfortable. Um, and we know that when there are uh, um, significant insect outbreaks in forest systems, some woodpeckers that live in certain altitudes and in those forest systems become the first responders. And they go after the, the beetles that they know uh, are, are nesting inside those, um, those stress trees. And in so doing, when they probe and excavate in there to go after those insects that are not accessible to other insectivores, they're actually making those insects um, accessible to the other ones that otherwise wouldn't be able to access them. So the woodpeckers are really good neighbors. <clears throat> So that, okay, so that was just that point. I just got ahead of myself there. Oh, and, 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 and oh, I, I got my points reversed. So what I wanted to say back there was that by, by consuming the insects that are infesting trees, we can argue that um, it's reasonable to believe that woodpeckers are actually extending the life of some trees. All right, so I, Dave said that you guys would probably like to see who the cavities, the secondary cavity nesters are in California. So here they are, and you're wondering why some of them are in blue font. Well, the ones in blue font are the ones that very often will use nest boxes. Not all cavity nesting birds will accept nest boxes, but the ones in blue do, and of course, uh, some are more commonly do so than others. We certainly have a lot of wood ducks you accepting nest boxes um, in Central California, I believe. Um, barn owls do, you know, we, we, we often put those in places where we want rodents cons um, cons uh, populations to be managed. Um, the western screech owl, not as often as the barn owl uses uh, nest boxes, but certainly the house wren is a huge um, user of nest boxes. Mountain bluebird and western bluebird and white-breasted nuthatch. Um, and violet green straw and tree saw are perhaps the most common. Uh, we do have uh, Lucy's warblers um, nesting in California, but only rarely and on the fringe between uh, California and Arizona border. And you guys might know that the Tucson Audubon has a wonderful conservation program in place um, trying to support Lucy's warblers. It's this fascinating project and they're doing a great job out there. So this gives you an idea as to um, some of the secondary cavity nesters that um, will benefit from woodpeckers in our area, except of course the barn owl um, and the um, spotted owl, they need larger cavities, right? Okay, so obviously the woodpecker, as I just inferred, uh, cannot make cavities for all the larger species, even the mammals that use large cavities in their trees. So we really need to focus on our 
very old heritage trees or veterans trees and really advocate for them that that tree care providers and land managers go out of their way to support however they can the safe retention of these very large trees they're, they're becoming harder and harder to find in the urban um, landscape Okay, so one of the most underappreciated values of a dead tree, my friends, is the unobstructed view that they provide. You know, people like unobstructed views, don't they? But you all have seen birds perch at the tippy top of trees, right? And you see hawks, especially up there. But every bird, small and large, likes an unobstructed view. And that is why dead trees are so favored by so many birds, because the hawk sitting out there can look over its territory and see prey scurrying on the ground or flying by, right? Can come back and eat its meal unmolested. Mm -hmm. um, birds can use these, these tops of dead trees as posts for guarding their territory, for making sure no intruders come in and take over. They can use these posts for, for courting females, right? Because let's face it, who gets the territory gets to keep all the assets in it, and who gets the girl gets their genes passed on. So uh, let's never underestimate the value of an unobstructed view, and that is a unique value of dead trees. But dead trees have many, many, I'm gonna use the word features, arborists use the term defects, and we're trying to change that focus, <laughs> that language, because when we call these features of trees defects, like stress cracks and lightning cracks and so on, uh, we infer that they're all hazards. Now, some of them may be a hazard, but they're not all equally has hazardous. And so we ask well, um, tree care providers to really, when they're doing tree risk assessments, to, can, to weigh the, the habitat value of those defects relative to the risk that they, they uh, or the hazard that they pose. So here you see a western fence lizard um, seeking perhaps shelter or looking for prey or thermoregulating in that stress crack. And on the right you see a group, I think there are four four or five brown creepers roosting in that split, in that tree. Isn't that just amazing? And of course, you guys know, I'm sure you've seen bees nesting in stress cracks and in cavities in trees. So there are many different types of defects, can't go into all of them, but um, it just shows that when a tree starts to fail and it de develops these defects, oh my gosh, the habitat value of the tree just goes up and up and up. And you well know that the soft wood of, of in dead trees provides a perfect place for the acorn woodpecker to stash its acorns, right? But the, it's the acorn woodpecker is not the only bird and organism that stores food in dead trees. All those nooks and crannies are perfect for storing seeds and nuts for other birds and storing um, actually insects for the winter or bringing in fruit or, or grains of some kind because who gets to store for the winter? has a better chance of surviving the winter, right? And you recognize this sound, I know you do, as drumming, right? This is the drumming of a uh, downy woodpecker. So we get to say that dead trees are a substrate for communication for woodpeckers. Now, obviously woodpeckers drum on live trees as well and on many man-made things, as I'm sure you know, but the benefit that a, a dead tree provides is that the sound carries farther. So woodpeckers use dead trees to communicate with one another and their adversaries. And because, as I mentioned before, the wood softens and decays and breaks down in dead trees, what happens is these little depressions occur in different parts of the tree and birds use them as anvils for crushing seeds and nuts there right, and for crushing the exoskeletons of, of um, insects to feed themselves or to take these bits and pieces back to their young. And I did, one of the handouts I sent you was a composition of all the other additional benefits that dead trees provide that we don't have time to go into today, other than nesting, other than providing insects 
those are the main uh, benefits that people know uh, that trees have, which is nesting opportunities and insect prey for many, many wildlife. But their trees have so many other be auxiliary benefits. I put them in that handout and I hope you all check it out on your Audubon website. So thanks to the California Department of Forestry and Fire Prevention, I learned that we have about 35 mammals in California that use their trees or downward in some fashion at some time of the year. And I, I'm not familiar with all of them, but we can all appreciate that each one of these organisms plays an important role in keeping e ecosystems in balance. So obviously raccoons do, and we have the big brown bat that doesn't nest in their trees, but does roost in their trees. And we have gray fox that use them for denning or for, for shelter from the elements. And we have the southern flying squirrel that are in a number of our forests. There are many subspecies of the flying squirrel, but they use the abandoned cavities of woodpeckers and also natural cavities in their trees. And we have one arboreal salamander, just like the western fence lizard, uses dead trees for thermoregulation, for foraging for insects, and for, you know, um, camouflage and for um, hiding from predators. And we have trees, the California tree frog, many subspecies, they too sh seek shelter in the same way the salamander does, behind loose bark, in hollows in trees, and even in cavities in trees. And um, last but not least, we have the carpenter bee. I have the fascination of watching this female bee make a hole in a dead tree. And uh, she makes uh, tunnels in there. And I'll show you what the tunnels look like. This is a sample I took of a, a section that was cut from a tree. They make these tunnels in there and lay their eggs in there. And I don't know, some weeks later, here come the, the baby carpenter bees out. So. Uh, Many insects obviously nest in dead trees. All right, so let's let's talk now about what happens when a tree falls. Well, when a tree falls in the forest or across a stream, they actually create connectivity between landscapes. They serve as sort of a corridor to allow organisms to move from one habitat patch to another. So this is particularly important for animals that are breeding right, a way to disperse and, and spread their genes out instead of inbreeding in smaller confined patches. And they help to, re this connectivity helps to reduce predation of animals because animals get to disperse and are, are perhaps less vulnerable to, to, uh, to predators. And who hasn't uh, used a, uh, a a log in a stream to cross over or to fish from as the um, as a raccoon might, right? And logs in streams, you know, provide many benefits to slowing water flow, right? And for improving the, the quality of the, the stream bed, just a log in a stream is a great thing or a log across a habitat where uh, wildlife couldn't otherwise um, cross is just an unknown benefit of dead trees. All right, so then let's talk about actual downwood. Many, many benefits. So you see the snake resting on this log, how beautifully camouflaged it is. So the snake might be there or under the log or next to it on the ground, um, looking for little rodents scurrying by, right? Um, and um, it may seek thermal regulation there. And then we have logs that, that um, help to trap leaf litter and keep moisture in the ground and provide cover for prey um, and, and for organisms, especially during the fall and winter. And of course, we have logs that trap snow, right? And help to reduce snow melt in the, in the spring, slow it down a little bit. Um, and of course, we have logs just on, in our parks and open spaces that provide shelter and cover for wildlife. It's just, as, it's just important, however, that if we have a choice as to where these logs lie in our space, open spaces, that we put them in partial shade because in hot places in California, those logs can become awfully hot and lose their appeal or their, their suitability for shelter. And to always, if we can, place those logs parallel to the contours of the land so that they can assist with um, reducing erosion and, and water runoff better if they're parallel to the contour of the land. And of course, we know logs across water provide wonderful places for wildlife and, and, 
ducks in particular, to rest and, um, and take care of their young out of the water. All right, so need I say the obvious? In nature, nothing is superfluous. Okay, so let's shift our mindset now and go to the, uh, to the think in terms of where we live, the urban forest as we call it, and um, talk about how we can convert has hazardous trees into habitat trees. And that there is, if you don't remember anything else I share today, take away this with you. If you see a dead tree in a good habitat, always ask, does the tree need to be removed completely? That is really a key question in urban spaces where risk, you know, is an ongoing concern. So there are preferred locations for dead trees in urban areas. I'm just gonna share them in a minute, but I want to emphasize that safety must always come first. And when we bird advocates have, go off being ambassadors for dead trees, we really have to let people know that we recognize that safety is a concern. You know, a cavity for bird cannot be a priority if it's gonna put people and property at risk. So our credibility increases if we agree with them that safety is important. And um, as we talked about earlier, uh, Dave and, and, um, <coughs> and Judy and I talked about safety being such an important thing and how people have to evaluate the risk of a tree before they decide whether or not it can stay safely in place. You know, it's really important when necessary to call upon a qualified arborist who is qualified in risk assessment. And if you wanna know where to find such a person, if you don't already know one in your community, I would go to treesaregood.com. That is, a, in case you don't know it, that is a wonderful website for anything tree related, anything. I urge you to explore it. If you want to plant a tree in your yard and you want to know what the best tree is for, for the space you have and for the, what you're hoping the tree will do for you, that is the place. Everything tree beneficial for even the layperson is there, but referrals for arborists in your region can be found there. Okay, so let's talk about, you know, the best possible places to, um, to advocate for a dead tree. Well, obviously it's in high quality green spaces, right? Whether they're natural or parks, we want places that have good tree canopy, good tree diversity, um, good vegetation uh, height diversity and spatial diversity. Hopefully, um, as little impervious services, maybe bodies of water, all these things make for a quality habitat. So um, these are the places where wildlife are most inclined to take care, benefit from a dead tree is in rich quality green spaces. And you know, as well as I do, that riparian areas are such high habitat quality uh, uh, areas in general, and these are perfect places to, um, to beg that the, the dead tree be left in place or at least managed so most of it can remain in place. And last but not least, on the perimeters of properties like golf courses and parks where there is less, um, you know, people pass, fewer people passing by, um, people usually frequent, you know, the trails in parks and around picnic benches and playgrounds, but these remote edges around big um, green spaces and parks and even golf courses who can tolerate a dead tree out there on the perimeter, not in the middle of the fairway, right? These, hab these habitat perimeters are good places to advocate for dead trees. So obviously you already know not uh, a dead tree is not good in all locations. So if you have, we see here a tree care per, um, team taking down a dead tree because it's right against a roadway and right against houses. Now I have seen Municipalities actually save some dead trees in just that place, but it's the exception rather than the rule. Um, so, you know, if we're gonna invest in our time advocating for a dead tree, a tree along our busy roadway is not a place where I would begin. And I do have, a, I, I wanna point out to our listeners that I did give you a handout to explain what to, uh, explains what to consider before removing a dead tree, particularly during the nesting season, particularly when birds might be in there. But you know, birds, cavity nesting birds roost in, in dead trees, even in the winter. So it's not safe to assume that because it's not nesting season, there may not be a bird roosting in that cavity. So, but, 
that there are special things, precautions we should take to try and determine whether or not that it's really safe to remove that tree right now. So um, that handout I think would, would be helpful to you. Um, okay, and we also don't wanna advocate for dead trees that have been infested by bad pests, particularly non-native pests for which there are no predators. When there are bad pest infestations in trees, uh, the tree care providers and, and um, property managers and cities are not gonna be happy if we come petitioning for them to retain these trees. They want to control the insect spread and so this is not a tree to, to advocate for. Nor will Cal Fire uh, want to support us um, uh, su uh, supporting dead trees right in high fire risk zones right at the urban wildland interface right they want this clearance i'm sure you guys know all about that so we need to be smart in to, in, in terms of uh, where we advocate for dead trees all right so not all dead if you're looking at to select a dead tree which one to save not all dead trees have the same values the one on the left here, this call it a soft snag, and that is because, whoop, uh, what happened there? I, I tripped myself up. The soft snag is one in which all the bark has been removed, or most of the bark, right? So this tree still has value. I'm not saying it doesn't. In the forest system, it's perfect. But in an urban area, if you want the tr a tree to last as long as possible and have this greatest, um, you know, longevity and greatest benefits, you might not want to select a soft snag, primarily even though it's great for insects and for other shelter bits of shelter and so on, because the bark is missing, you see the nest cavity can't have any real integrity and it's much more susceptible to being predated. So, um, you know, it's it wouldn't be my first choice in terms of advocating for dead tree if I had a hard snag like this to choose from, right? That tree, particularly being a conifer, is likely to stand a lot longer and provide much more nest um, in cavity integrity because it has so much bark on it. And notice that the managers left, the tree care providers left little perches, which is a great thing if you can do that. But you can strip a, a dead tree entirely of every limb if you have to, if, it's, if safety recommends it, and it's still highly valuable without perches. All right, so another thing to consider when you want to select a dead tree is to look for the record of a woodpecker's work. A woodpecker is the only bird I know that leaves a record of its work in trees. So you know that a cavity is record of a, wood, that a woodpecker has been there, right? And a more freshly um, excavated cavity is one in which you can see the wood is lighter, right? It's fresh wood. Now that will darken over time and that doesn't mean that that cavity is no longer useful because you and I know secondary cavity nesters over a period of years may use that, that cavity, right? So look for woodpecker cavities on dead trees. It tells you, ah, that tree has already been found to be valuable. Look for woodpecker starts. You guys, I'm sure have seen this. The woodpecker is obsessively exploring weakened trees to see if they're receptive for excavating a cavity. And they go around making all these little holes. Sometimes they're perfectly round and they go as far as an engine and they say, ah, not quite ready. This is too much, this work is too hard. I'll come back here next season or two years from now, whatever, or another woodpecker will come and try it again. So wood starts, woodpecker starts, cavity starts, are a great indicator that that tree has potential as a habitat tree. Then you want to want to look for evidence of a woodpecker's foraging. Now you guys know that the woodpecker has a bill and it uses it like a chisel, right? So when the guys that go into the, into the bark looking for insects, they're using the bill and they're chiseling around these little holes where they believe the insects are inside. Notice the circumference of these holes. Do you see how irregular they are? This is characteristic of woodpecker's work compared with, check this out, holes that have smooth circumferences. When wood boring beetles go into trees, um, you know, they sometimes make tiny holes or they go in behind loose bark. But a lot of the holes that they make are made when they exit the trees. And as far as I know, boy, I, I'm not an expert on insects, so I'm sure there are exceptions to what I'm saying. But as far as I know, 
all of them, no matter the size of the hole or the shape of the hole, the circumferences are smooth. So that is how you tell the difference between a wood uh, insect exit hole and a woodpecker's foraging hole. And last but not least, you want to look for, when bark has been removed, you look for what we call beetle galleries, these little shallow tunnels that are behind loose bark, right? Woodpeckers remove the bark to get back to the beetle lava that are in there, the grubs. So you, you learn to read a tree like this, and you see, ah, Wildlife have already found this tree and are telling me it's valuable. And so particularly if it's not pretty hard, this, most of the bark is still intact. And, and you bring that tree care provider over there and you say, is this tree safe to safe in place? Let's save this tree if it's in a suitable habitat and a suitable location in the habitat. All right, so then the question is, okay, so what's the ideal size and height of a dead tree? Well, I'm going to say one thing now and then I'm going to contradict myself in two slides down the line. So in the perfect world, if you have a big old honking dead tree, if you can at least save a tree that's 15 feet high, you've done a great thing. And, and it's ideal if that tree is at least 12 inches in diameter at breast height right? And the, 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 the tree care provider will do reduction cuts and they will shorten the limbs, right? And make the tree as safe as possible. These are the recommendations that a tree risk assessor can make. What it's going to take to allow the tree, to reduce the tree's risk and to allow it to stay in place as long as possible, right? And the, the, the tree care provider is going to suggest that that tree be on a monitoring schedule to make sure that is still safe to stay in place for the next six months or the next year, whatever they recommend. All right, and if you have an opportunity to put in a little wish, ask them when they do those reduction cuts to create what we call coronation cuts or crown cuts. Some people call them, you make these jagged cuts, particularly if you're, if you're saving a hard snag, and a conifer in particular, that will take a long time to decline, to decay, by making those jagged cuts at the top of the tree and at the edges of the limbs that you're shortening, you're allowing water and bacterial, bacteria to get in there and fungal spores to get in there, which hastens the decay of the tree. And that's all those organisms that I mentioned at the top of the, the presentation, get in there and start working that tree so the woodpeckers can come and do their thing, right? Coronation cuts are a great, cool thing. All right. Now, you know, as well as I do, that live trees sometimes have dead limbs, huh? And everybody says, take the limb out, take the limb out. Well, I'm here to say, don't take the limb out if you don't have to. Now, ask if they will, if they could at least just reduce the length or shorten the limb. Now, any dead limb in a live tree is a good thing because it probably has insects that birds can forage on, right? But, if you can save a limb that's at least four inches in diameter, potentially, and if you leave it long enough, potentially you have a limb in which a small woodpecker will nest, like the nuttles and the downy. I've seen them do this. That was going on here when I first saw this beautiful sycamore. This big trunk was spread over a small parking lot below, and they had two cavity nesting birds nesting them. One of them was a uh, acorn wood, woodpecker. The other one was a, a bluebird. So, okay, so if they can at least shorten it and leave, I'm gonna say as much as you can for safety. As much as safety allows, leave as much length as you can because woodpeckers need about 10 or 15 inches depending on the size of the woodpecker depth for the cavity because they're obviously not making a cavity just behind the whole entrance right they're make, they're going down deep you guys know that so you want the length in that limb to allow them to dig down there because they're too their nestlings are too vulnerable right behind the entrance hole so the longer the limb you can leave in place the better and if it's four inches in diameter you've got a potential nesting limb these are the compromises we can make in urban areas. Beg for those dead limbs to stay in place, but just make them safe. All right, so I said I was going to contradict what I said earlier about how tall a dead tree should be. I have two lovely examples for you of how never to underestimate the value of a short stump in the right habitat. Now, this narrow uh, big old parking lot with cars and shopping center all around is not not going to be helpful to birds right but 
this, this stump right here was in a very busy parking lot in Yosemite. You see the forest in the background? When I took this picture, there were, it was a Williamson sapsucker and a mountain bluebird nesting in this stump. This is a busy parking lot. Campers coming in and go, people coming to get their chips and their ice for their coolers. Birds nesting right there. And it was valuable because of this heavy, um, high value habitat right there adjacent to it. Now this little stump here on the left, that stump, I'm five foot three, that stump was no taller than I am. And I saw Nuttall's woodpecker nesting in that stump. And that stump was no more than four or five inches in diameter. So in the right place, never underestimate the value of a stump. And who can argue about the safety of a stump, folks, right? Okay, and uh, so I'm gonna wrap this up now. In the perfect world, if this golden opportunity comes by, uh, and you have a number of dead trees together, oh my gosh, petition for that cluster of trees to be retained. Because woodpeckers really like having clusters of dead trees or, or, or many trees in their territory because they like to roost in them and they like to nest in them. And of course, it's ideal in a habitat if we can have trees in all successional stages from living trees, all is, you know, going up to mature trees and uh, distressed or dying trees all the way down from you know, soft snags to, to hard snags to soft snags and down wood. When we have the diversity of tree life in our habitat, we have a much richer habitat and much more diversity of wildlife. And I would suggest to always, if you get to retain a dead tree, to put a sign on it. Oh my goodness, we sell two signs there cheap 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 five dollars for this little one and we have a bigger one i think it's maybe eight dollars i can't remember we sell lots of them all over the country once that sign is up there it tells the passerby oh this tree has value the the park ranger or whoever the, the conservation folks that own the manager's land are telling me this tree has value i thought it was useless and it tells the person also that we decided that tree is safe to stay in place, at least for a while. So don't be afraid of being near it. Spend some time, look at this tree, see if there's any critters crawling around the tree, any birds flying in and out of holes. Because folks, once we've raised the consciousness, that consciousness raising is irreversible, isn't it? All for a little sign. Uh, so one of the resources I really, really want to advocate is one just freshly off the press. So I don't know if you know about the Arbor Day Foundation, their 100-year-old organization that promotes trees and the management of trees and the importance of good tree canopy in cities and neighborhoods and so on. They have so many wonderful resources on their website. But they put out, in case you don't know, on a regular basis, Tree City USA bulletins. And they, their most recent bulletin I participated in providing information for is called Trees Are For The Birds Or Should Be. And this is a four page bulletin. One whole page is devoted to dead trees and down wood. They did a marvelous job, but every Audubon chapter should have pay the tent, but I think it's five bucks, five bucks I can get this on to download it whatever and you put it on your website and have everybody read it because it is probably the, the most valuable comprehensive um, handout for a resource for a bird lover just marvelous okay and I want to encourage you to go to the um, to the CCI website and particularly to check out the resources tab here this is where we have many more resources um, for you and even for tree care for providers and we have resources for kids there and I don't want to leave without promoting that you guys take a look at this video it's seven I think it's seven minutes long we created it about two two years ago it is a charming video a true story of a picky rooney tree in a park here in our region that a photojournalist documented for me. She went there morning after morning for a year, documenting all the wildlife activity in this tree. It is just 
delightful. I wrote the narration. We got a professional narrator to do it, to beautiful music. It is a great thing to show to kids, to introduce kids to the value of dead trees. If you want me to send you the file, I'll send it to you. It is just the loveliest little video, I think. So I encourage you to look at that. And I think I'm, I'm done, yes. So I, I want you to know that we have the Catholic Conservation Initiative has a website that I put out quarterly. It's called The Whole Story. And if you want to receive the, the electronic, uh, I'm sorry, the newsletter, did I say website? We have a newsletter, it goes out about four times a year. And if you wanna get the newsletter, um, we send it to you electronically and you just write me here from our website or you can go to our website through the contact contact us tab and just tell us to send it to you and also we have a facebook page of course we continue the story of dead trees on there and i want you i also want to do a shout out for the tree care for birds and other wildlife program um this i have to tell you folks that when i formed a partnership with tree care industry it was one of the best decisions of my life i have learned so much and it has really advanced the cause of birds and protecting birds uh, doing tree care in California. And there are a load of resources on there. Um, best management practices for tree care to prevent harm to birds. Um, so Dave, I think what I'm going to do is see if I have people have, that have uh, put questions. If you have questions for Julian, go to the chat function and type in your question along with your name. And what I will do is call people's names so we don't have five people trying to call to talk at once. Um, so while I'm waiting for questions, um, what I would like to say is that if you go to Mora Coast Audubon Society's Facebook page, you will find all of the handouts that Jillian was talking about. So Dave, I don't know if you see other ones than I do. I'm seeing lots of thank yous, which are great. Yeah. Um, if people have any questions, please type your question or just put your name and we'll call you and you can ask your question. You'll unmute your, your microphone. To unmute, if you're going to do that, the easiest way is to press the space bar down and hold it while you're talking. And when you're done, release the space that space bar and that will mute you back again. Okay, I'm seeing uh, Mary Sturm has a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Mary. Hi, Jillian. I'm wondering if your group or um, any agencies are working with PG&E or state parks or national parks to influence their policies on what they do with dead trees? Um, I guess the short answer is no, not directly. Um, you know, Pacific, the electric conduction companies operate with a set of rules of their own. And the, the, the guidance they have to follow um, actually, you know, pertains primarily to safety in terms of trees near power lines, right? And there are very strict regulations even beyond their control as to how close a tree can be to a power line. And power lines vary, of course, and there are different distances. So, um, you know, they have to do what they believe is important for safety. And of course, with the fire risk these days, you know, those, that guidance is very, very strict. And so we don't typically, um, you know, work with them directly because we know that they have they have to follow that guidance. So, and uh, and you know, I, I may I may not be fully correct in this, but it's my impression that when they manage trees um, for safety, that they're not managing the trees for any other purpose, not for habitat, not for aesthetics. You know, and so as a result, sometimes the condition in which they leave trees. It may be displeasing to many of us, but to answer your question directly, no, I'm not, none of us on our team, as far as I know, are working with them directly. Okay, thanks. Do you want to share something, or some concern or suggestion in that regard? Oh, I just, I noticed that I've been, I've been watching a hawk nest in my neighborhood, and I noticed there's not been much activity the last couple of days, and I also noticed that it looked like they're 
with some fresh cuts in a nearby tree. And I know that they have been working in the neighborhood to, to clear out space around the poles. Yeah. So I was just curious as to whether that could be influenced at all. Well, you know, I'll, I'll add to what I just said by saying that they still have to follow the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that says you cannot destroy an active nest. They might get permission if there's an eminent risk of, of dan you know, danger to people or property, they, they probably would be able to get a permit to um, remove the nest, uh -huh. locate it or take those birds into rehab or whatever. But the uh -huh. laws, the bird protection laws do provide, they just don't have permission to go and willy nilly destroy active nests. So, you know, mm -hmm. one of my big wishes is that Audubon, I know folks that we have lots of reason to be angry at electric companies for this work sometimes and, and for the number of casualties that you know happen during tree care but if we see ourselves as partners and when we see a, a, we know that work is about to be done you know in a certain area maybe we got we get notice of it or whatever we see the trucks arriving if we know there's an active nest in there instead of taking an adversarial approach if we go say hey guys i know you're here to do a job but i want you to know there is an active nest in here so we'll, let's please talk about that before you proceed they have a responsibility to consider the information you're giving them right and right. they will have an avion biologist specialist in their company or more than one that they have to call then perhaps and right and get her advice as to what to do about that active nest so if we can be proactive and alert them you know right and we can impact their decisions maybe they don't have to do it today maybe they can wait till the birds fledge you know maybe they can justify delaying the work for three weeks or four weeks or whatever until the birds have less they really need to do that if they can without jeopardizing safety so always right. speak up but i'm an advocate for being respectful you know being considerate you know just acting like you're a partner respecting what they have to do but sharing this this legitimate concern you get much further that way with them i find yeah <laughs> Thank you for your question, Mary. Sure. Dave, are you seeing any more questions? Um, no, uh, what I'm seeing is a lot of people just enthusing over how great the presentation was. So, and I, I, would, I would second that, but no, I don't see any, does anybody else have any questions? Okay. All right. Good, well, good, 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 thank you good so evening. much. Good, good evening. May I ask a question? Absolutely. As a homeowner, what what are our rights when commercial companies come on our property and say they have to trim the tree? or they have to do things to our tree that I don't feel is necessary. For example, they come most every summer and they butcher the tree that is borderline on the electrical wires and takes all the shading from our back patio and it destroys the habitat for the animals in the tree every year. And I fight them on this and try and get them to only trim it down a little, but they always butcher it. And I don't know what I can do legally to stop them from doing that on my property. Right. Uh, I, I understand it's so distressing, right? Um, so I'm going to have to repeat what I said earlier is that these, these conduction companies that, you know, either have their own crew teams or they hire contractors out to clear the power lines have mandates to do that they have to by law clear lines 
a certain distance from from the trees and so um you know that law comes before your or my preference as to uh, how tall the trees are or how many limbs there that remain on the tree because they have a responsibility to ensure your safety and mine so um you know the, the reason that we have a problem of like what you described and many people do is that unfortunately two things one is people have planted or city even unknowingly planted trees that grow so tall that they encroach on the power lines or the power lines were put in after the trees were planted so that the trees it's, it's a case of the wrong tree in the wrong place you know we're getting wiser now and so municipalities when they're talking about you know, replacing trees or planting new trees, and they know those trees are going to be under power lines. I think they're starting to do a better job of picking the right species, the one that won't grow any uh, any taller than it, that that puts that tree in a position where it has to be mismanaged in order to provide that safety clearance. So. Um, I'm afraid you're kind of stuck with it because the law says that your safety and mine have but, to be assured. But, what, but is there, is, I'm sorry, but is there a place for us to look at those guidelines so that we know what those guidelines are? Because they literally butcher the tree down to nothing. So is there allowed to do that? What are the guidelines okay. so, yes. are they oh. allowed to do? The, the, those guidelines are available. I am sure if you go to um, their website, you poke around, you you know you f you find contact whatever. Those guidelines are public record. Okay, so I'll add. I'm glad you asked that question because I'll add something else. There is a there's also the element of economy of effort here. So if you have a if they know you have a tree species that is a rapid grower, right, and they have a budget that allows them maybe to come through certain regions maybe only once a year, not every six months. Sometimes I understand, I'm not an expert on this, but sometimes I understand they may reduce the tree's height even shorter than the law said they had to do it. Otherwise they'd be coming back three months from now or six months from now more every and it's costing the company more, right? So it's an economy of effort. They're, sometimes they're cutting a little bit more because they know that that tree will not encroach on the power line before they're scheduled to come back out again. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, you know, their job is not to trim the tree for aesthetics, right? It's simply do the clearance and get out of there. So unfortunately, the trees are being, uh, you know, in a kind way, I think it's respectfully mismanaged because the wrong tree is better the wrong tree to begin with. Thank, thank you, I understand. You're welcome. It's not a very satisfying answer, I know. <laughs> we have a question from Meredith. Meredith, you want to unmute yourself? Well, anyway, Meredith's question is, where would you recommend a pers person start volunteering to learning more about living trees or even dead trees in Los Angeles? I've had a hard time trying to get into volunteering. You know, my first thought was to, to become a member of the Western chapter of the International Society of Arboriculture, but it's, it's a, it, the membership is, you know, it's like $100 or something. It's pretty expensive. So where to learn about trees? Um, gee, you know, I, I, I guess I want to think about that. I, I would say that tree care for birds, uh, excuse me, um, treesaregood.com, that website I referred to earlier, is a great place to learn about trees. Um, uh, I, you know, I do not know who is offering like tree walks. I have, uh, I have been lately recommending that, that um, Audubon societies invite good reputable tree care providers to come provide tree walks and bird walks joint bird and tree walks just as you go out birding that the I invite an arborist with you and have that arborist talk about trees trees needs the best ways to take care of them you know maybe how to maybe volunteer opportunities working with the urban forest council in your area right uh, the urban forest council may be a place to, to volunteer but i think Audubon societies if they form this partnership 
with, with tree care providers, brought them as speakers into your meetings, do present a webinar like the, like this one to talk about trees. You know what what you should know in terms of selecting the right tree. What's to care? What you should know in terms of um, care, proper care for young trees. You know, even on the treecareforbirds.com um, website, I had just uploaded a whole page on the ways in which we harm trees. Because folks, trees in urban areas don't live long as long as they should because of the human impacts on trees. We damage trees in ways we have no idea we're doing damaging them and we're cutting their longevity. And we know, you know, the benefits of the trees, right? We need them more now than ever because of climate change. So I you could even go to the treecareforbirds.com website and, and look under resources and drop down and see um actions that harm trees and you will see pictures and explanations of things we inadvertently do that compromise tree health. Terrific. Any more questions from anyone? Well, Jillian, I really want to thank you for coming tonight. It has been an exceptional program and I'm hearing a lot of people, myself included, who have learned a lot on this. So thank you very much for putting this on. I think you have inspired us to take a, a deeper look at trees with the caveat that safety comes first. Thank you so much, Judy. It's been a pleasure being with you and thank you everyone for spending your time with me. It's, it always brightens my heart and is an updraft for me to know more people are out there who will appreciate that trees and advocate for them. So thank you very much. Keep safe, keep healthy. Okay. Thank you so much. I just wanna let you know at the highest, we had 94 people participating tonight. Really? Wow. Oh, yeah. that's lovely. That's yeah. one hour's work influencing 90 people. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you okay. so much, guys. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.